Okay, last week we were pausing in our analysis of the Bible, looking at proofs of inspiration, and I suggested to you that um, if you're going to talk with somebody about the Bible to try to prove to them that it's the Word of God, there's only one way to go about doing that. And it would be the same way that Jesus went about it, the same way Peter went about it, the same way Paul went about it. We've already covered all that in the book, Is Christianity Logical, haven't we? On the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and said, okay, you know, this is the case, this is the case, this is the case, this is the case. Therefore, God hath made this same uh, Jesus Lord whom you crucified, made him Lord in Christ. And we saw in 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul had a series of hypothetical syllogisms. If this is the case, then this is the case. If, if uh, there is no resurrection, then Jesus was not raised. If Jesus was not raised, then a number of things follow from that. So that logical offering of evidence and then drawing a conclusion. So here is uh, the way to organize your thinking on how to go about proving to somebody, even an atheist, that the Bible is the word of God. If the Bible possesses certain properties, P sub 1, P sub 2, P sub 3, and so on, properties that would prove it to be the Word of God, if it contains those, then it is the Word of God. That's premise one. Well, does the Bible possess these properties? It does. It, it possesses properties that are both necessary and sufficient. Some properties that are necessary, but don't they're not sufficient to prove it, but you would expect it to have those properties if it is, in fact, from God. For example, it would claim to be from God, wouldn't it? God wouldn't write a message to the human race and then not tell them, hey, this is from me. <laughs> but then there would be properties that are sufficient, any one of which might stand on its own to prove it. And so then we just... We were in the middle last week of just going through some of these. What, what are some of these properties that the Bible possesses that makes it stand apart from all other books on the planet and that uh, they are attributes of inspiration? Well, it has a very high purpose and makes a very high claim. P sub 2. And the, you know, these are just arbitrary that someone's come up with. Uh, it is all sufficient. Think about that, the all-sufficiency of the Bible. It's all-sufficient for certain things. You don't need anybody or anything else. It's all-sufficient uh, in terms of it being authoritative, in terms of dealing with metaphysics, things beyond the physical realm. Uh, polemically has to do with argumentation. It's, it's uh, all-sufficient. So you know, what, what uh, psychology book have mere humans produced in the last hundred years? And there have been a lot of them that are all sufficient for addressing, you know, psychology comes means the study of the mind. You know, they all are flawed, most of them are flawed, and they all fall far short of the all-sufficiency of the Bible in terms of its dealing with the mind. The creator of the mind wrote the Bible and includes within it all that we need in order to be psychologically oriented properly and, and so forth. Socially, morally, spiritually, scientifically, pragmatically. This word has to do with last things, like what's going to happen at the end of time, what's, uh, what's in the afterlife. This has to do with knowledge. You can know certain things. This has to do with salvation. The, is the Bible all sufficient for providing and explaining salvation. Yeah. Well, what other book is, other than mere men who have just taken what the Bible says on the matter, or else they have false ideas about salvation? The Bible's all sufficient in that regard. It's uh, all sufficient in terms of its accuracy. And we've looked at a number of these, haven't we? And we're going to look at this one tonight, but geographically, scientifically, notice how many different categories there would be here. It's uh, accurate in medical science, in astronomy, you know, in geology or whatever that it, it happens to touch upon. It's 
So the accuracy, the inerrancy, the infallibility of the Bible is proof of its inspiration. It's a book of unity. It is unified in doctrine from beginning to end, structure, in its theme and purpose, in its consistency. There's no self-contradiction. Although critics and skeptics for centuries have tried to say, well, this contradicts this in the Bible. Um, got a letter from a fellow that I think is in his 60s or 70s, said he's been a member of the church all of his life, but he's tried to read every book he could get his hand on, written by atheists. And uh, he says, now, don't, un don't misunderstand, I'm still a Christian and a member of the church, but I wish somebody would deal with all these contradictions that the atheists say exist. You know, for example, the uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when they report the same incident, they, they contradict each other. And uh, he said several other things. And I wrote him back and I said, every single one of these are on our website. They've been there for years. I didn't put it that way by any means, but I just called his attention. He said he'd read everything AP had ever put out. I'm thinking, okay, you must be getting up there like me in years and forgetting things. But, um, I mean, even one of the things he brought up is, has a very specific article, article addressing that very thing. See, when you go read that stuff in an atheist book and it's boom, 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 one after another, you're thinking, oh, yeah, what's the answer to this? And then you go read an article that answers it and it's like, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. But if all you do is feed your mind and your soul and your heart with a lot of error and contradiction and stuff, then that can cause doubt. And you have to re react to that by, like the Bible says. Does God want us to not expose ourselves to unbelief and atheism and error? Well, you can do that. But then what are you to do with it? Just swallow it? 1 John 4, 1, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits to see whether it's. So you've got to put them to the test. You've got to analyze it, question it, challenge it, and make it prove itself. Anybody can write a book claiming things. Oh, we, we know for a fact that God doesn't exist. And that, some, that just shakes some people. Yes. Right. Theoretically, and supposedly that's what he had done. He said he'd been a member of the church his whole life and read everything AP has put out. So I don't know what order he did it in, but um, I was really surprised. You know, I thought he started out saying all that, but I've been reading a lot of atheist books, and you know, we really need to answer this stuff. And I thought, oh, he's come up with something new. <laughs> everything he brought up, the transmission of the text. How do we know that the Bible's been transmitted over the last 2,000 years in such a way that we can know we have the Bible? We've dealt with that extensively, brought up Mark 16, 9 through 20. If that's not in the Bible, how do we know? And oh, no, the Bible may not. All that's been answered. A lot of this stuff's been answered for centuries. You know, the Christian world has not just been standing by and sitting by thinking, oh, you know, we can't answer this stuff. There's been stuff answered for the last 2,000 years. There, there were criticisms brought up about Christianity and the Bible from the very beginning. So uh, my point is that this is a proof of the Bible. If some atheist somewhere could sustain a contradiction, an alleged discrepancy, and show that truly the Bible contradicts itself, well, then they'd have a case. But they haven't. And they can't, though they have tried for a long time and brought up so many quibbles, there's no end to it. How many they've brought up. Imagine a young person going off to a college and they get hit with that stuff right up front. Some of these teachers, they hit them hard with it quick. And uh, it 
can shake them to the core. I know because their parents write us and say, well, my son, we raised him in the church, took him to church every Sunday, Bible classes, camps. We did all that stuff. And our son has abandoned the faith because he read this book by Bart Ehrman or something like that. That's what they say. Uh, you know, we've started trying to encourage elderships and churches to include in their regular Bible class curriculum um, quarters devoted to apologetics. These kids have been, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be fed. Our country is going down the tubes rapidly. We all agree that. But what does that look like? What is a country that was very oriented toward Christianity? Most of the people went to church. What does that look like when it starts deteriorating and falling apart? Well, a whole lot of people don't go to church, and so their kids aren't getting any training in the Bible. And uh, even our, our churches, look how many of our liberal churches. You know, there, we got congregations right here in this city that would never have anything to do with this kind of stuff because it's argumentative, it's, uh, you know, we just need to love Jesus and preach Jesus, and they say stuff like that, and grace... So all, their, all those people sitting out there listening to that, that week after week, year after year, they're sitting ducks for this stuff coming down the pike that will draw them away. Unless they've just decided, I'm not going to live my life thinking, I'm just going to live my life feeling and let it go with that. So uh, when you get, really get down and analyze this thing down to the brass tacks, the Bible has so many properties that demonstrate its divine origin. P sub 4. P sub 5, profound themes. It's not that there aren't profound themes discussed in other books, but the Bible treats them in a way that shows its superiority. It shows no hesitation, no reluctance, no uncertainty. Here's what happens when you die. Most books that men have written is, well, you know, we got this theory and perhaps this and Bible lays it out there, and then when you piece all these profound themes together, they don't contradict each other. It all fits hand in glove. You know what the Bible says about the spirit realm and about you, the fact that you possess a spirit, a pneuma. It's doctrine of the church. It's doctrine of man. Who is man? What is man? How did he get here? What's he doing? Where's he going? What makes him tick? It's all there. The Bible possesses and treats profound themes. It manifests the property of verbal economy. It's well worded, uncanny, and, and very brief. Did, did we already deal with that brevity, the brevity of the Bible? If not, we'll deal with that in a week or two. Uh, it's knowledge. The knowledge that the Bible manifests of the past, present, and future, including, for example, prophecy. It's infallible knowledge of history. You know, they've come after the Bible so many times over the, the centuries. Oh, the Bible mentions this king or that person. Or, I mean, the Bible just lays itself out there for easy criticism because it refers to so many people, so many places in history, you know, from thousands of years ago. Moses lived 3,500 years ago. So for it to just come out and say, you know, that, uh, you know, for example, um, there was a time when they said uh, the Bible's not true because if Moses lived 3,500 years ago and he wrote the Ten Commandments and so forth, and yet we, we know that uh, humans had not uh, developed writing at that point. And that was a standard view. And then they uncovered something from some civilization that preceded Moses, and there was writing, you know, just stupidity. And... Uh, well, you know, there weren't camels in Egypt at the time that Moses said there were. They determined, oh, I guess there was. So archaeology and the like are not enemies to the Bible, they're friends. And um, it has, even though ch these challenges have come just over and over from every direction, you know, it may take a little bit of time and there may not be it may be that there hasn't been adequate uh, examination of a certain part of the world or something, uh, 
but every, I mean, there have been so many confirmations now, literally hundreds in the last uh, couple of hundred years. Right, right. Just the fact that there's no proof doesn't mean the proof is there, it just hadn't been found yet. But after a while, you know, you would think, okay, it's been proven accurate in so many areas. They, they've already made up their mind to reject the Bible, so they keep hoping one will come that will disprove it. Never mind the fact that it's, it's had a 100% record. Property 8, unexcelled ethical standard. It, it excels all other ancient books in terms of ethics. Number 9, it speaks authoritatively. Number 10, it speaks with finality. Number 11, the human writers show uh, certain attributes. We'll look at these uh, in more detail coming up. They refrain from character analysis, very impartial, dispassionate. We mentioned the brevity. The discussion of angels has an air of infallibility. The things that the Bible omits that you would not expect it to omit. And yet it does as if there's a controlling power that eliminates human curiosity, what we would want to include. Uh, the way it's been preserved, the genuineness of the Bible, the credibility, the integrity of the text of the Bible, the genuineness of the text, all of these have been uh, demonstrated very specifically. What? Provenance? I don't know. Never heard that. I, I hear what you're saying. I've never heard that used to refer to uh, the transmission of the text of the Bible. So I don't know. Can't answer that. Its view of deity. Look how the Bible depicts deity compared to Hinduism or even Islam. You know, Islam, of course, doesn't believe in the Trinity concept. Allah is just a single being. And yet, its depiction of Allah is. Uh, subpar. He's a cruel, vindictive, pretty mean fellow. The Bible has, the deity of the Bible is balanced and um, infinite in every category and it, it all fits together right. It's what you would expect if you have your thinking straight about, for example, the severity of God versus the, the compassion or the gentleness of God. I, you know, the more you study it and, and put it together and become acquainted with the deity there, the more it makes sense. And any challenge that's been raised about the nature of deity in the Bible can be answered. Uh, why was there creation at all? That's answered in the Bible. What is the purpose for human beings? Why are we here? What's this all about? You know, if the atheists are right, there is no purpose. We're all here accidentally, through chance, mechanistic forces of nature, and there is no meaning to life other than what you may make it. If you find meaning looking at a sunset and that gives you joy, well, that's it. That's what life's about. That, by the way, they say this kind of stuff in their writings. Why does there have to be more meaning than that? Why can't you be happy with that meaning that you create for yourself? You have a puppy dog? You like to go out in the morning, take it on a walk? Well, see, there is your heaven. Create it yourself. And on, after you're dead, that's it. There is no more you, no consciousness beyond the grave. Well, what a, what a shallow, really worthless existence, wasted existence, when there's so much nobility assigned to human life by God and such, such a high purpose uh, for, for living and existing. The Bible, uh, as it was being presented, remember, was confirmed. No miracles now, but there's no new revelation. But at the time, there were large numbers of people that were able to witness those things. All right, well, no doubt there are many other properties the Bible possesses. But follow the argumentation. If the Bible possesses certain properties, piece of one, piece of two, piece of 
to, to whatever, then the Bible is the word of God. Well, the Bible possesses those properties. Conclusion, therefore the Bible is the word of God. See how you can organize your thinking? So if you're talking with an atheist, you know, you might ask him or her, what would it take for you to know that the Bible is the word of God? Of course, you know, the, the logically prior thing to discuss with them is what would it take for you to believe that God exists? But, uh, so you might be, might not be an atheist you'd discuss this with. It might be somebody else that questions the validity of the Bible, which many of the mainline Protestant denominations do. They think it's flawed. Well, let's write down on a piece of paper some of these properties that you think would show a divine hand in the middle of that thing. And that's what we've been doing then in, uh, in the course of this study. For example, Let's look at some of the historicity of the Bible, the New Testament in particular, that has been established just in the book of Acts. Luke was an unbelievable first-rate historian, obviously because he was guided. No factual errors have ever been sustained in the Bible, though many have tried to do that. It is historically and graphic, geographically Accurate. We spent some time on the geographical part, didn't we? The Bible writers did not make the blunders that unaided authors have made throughout history. Acts is a prime example. Here is Sir William Mitchell Ramsey. Lived, uh, there he is in 1916, Scottish archaeologist, very prominent New Testament scholar, foremost authority of his day on the history of Asia Minor. Asia Minor. That's, you know, where all those cities of the book of Revelation are located. Um, extensive archaeological and historical studies convinced him. He literally, let me see if I put that here. He was knighted by the, what, queen in 1906. Nine honorary doctorates from several universities. So, you know, he's, he's been dead for a number of years, but... He, um, he had a distinguished career in terms of seeking out um, proof of, Bi of the Bible. Here's what I read he said. Uh, I read some of his stuff, and he just comes right out and says, you know, I've been studied in the Tübingen School, which was German theologians, very questioning of the Bible and so forth. And he said, I, I sat out, set out on an archaeological survey of, of uh, Asia Minor with the specific intention of, di of showing that the Bible's flawed. And the more I discovered, the more I dug, the more I was convinced this Luke guy was right on the money every time. He ended up convincing himself. In fact, in Acts, Luke refers to 32 countries, 54 cities, 9 Mediterranean islands, and 95 persons, 62 of whom are not named anywhere else in the New Testament. Well, that's a lot of detail. You are leaving yourself wide open. Hey, I did put that, uh, that statement here from his book, St. Paul the Traveler and the Roman Citizen. You might be able to download that free off uh, Google. Here's what he said. I may fairly claim to have entered on this investigation without any prejudice in favor of the conclusion which I shall now attempt to justify to the reader, i.e., the reliability of the book of Acts. On the contrary, I began with a mind unfavorable to it for the ingenuity and apparent completeness of the Tubigen theory had at one time quite convinced me. Uh, see, that's the junk that kids get in, public, in uh, universities, stuff like this. It did not lie then in my line of life to investigate the subjects uh, minutely, but more recently I found myself often brought in contact with the Book of Acts as an authority for the Topography <clears throat> Antiquity Society of Asia Minor. It was gradually borne in upon me 
that in various details the narr narrative showed marvelous truth. In fact, beginning with the fixed idea that the work was essentially a second century composition. You know, that's what the liberals try to say. Oh, the Bible's written much later than it claims. And it was written at a time where they knew all this stuff, see. So they weren't doing things that they didn't know. And never relying on its evidence as trustworthy for first century conditions, I gradually came to find it a useful ally in some obscure and difficult investigations. When he first went to Asia Minor, many of the cities mentioned in Acts had no known location and almost nothing was known of their detailed history or politics. Acts was the only record in Ramsey, skeptical, fully expected his own research to prove the author of Acts hopelessly inaccurate since no man could possibly know the details of Asia Minor more than a hundred years after the event when Acts was then supposed to have been written. So he set out to put the writer of Acts on trial. He devoted his life to unearthing the ancient cities and documents of Asia Minor. After a lifetime of study, here's his conclusion from the bearing of recent discovery. Further studies show that the book could bear the most minute scrutiny as an authority for the facts of the Aegean world and that it was written with such judgment, skill, art, and perception of truth as to be a model of historical statement. So he had no problem with Luke. I set out to look for truth on the borderland where Greece and Asia meet and found it there in Acts. You may press the words of Luke in a degree beyond any other historians and they stand the keenest scrutiny and the hardest treatment. If he could have found an, uh, a geographical or historical error in the book of Acts, he, he would have brought it to your attention because that was his original purpose. Some of this uh, can just go right over our head. Even though we're reading and studying our Bibles, we're not maybe paying that close attention to some of these details. For example, in Acts chapter 13, you remember Paul encounters Sergius Paulus and this sorcerer by the name of Elymas, uh, alternate name Bar-Jesus. And uh, we are informed that this Sergius Paulus, which is a good Roman name, term that Paul, uh, that Luke uses is proconsul. That's a very technical name, proconsul. And he is supposed to be the proconsul of Cyprus. See how detailed that is? He's leaving himself wide open if there was no such individual, let alone such a place. two types of uh, uh, provinces in the Roman Empire. See, the question there initially was, okay, the Roman Empire had proconsuls, but not in Cyprus. Because uh, that was a um, imperial province under the jurisdiction of the emperor and therefore should have been called a propraetor. The other type of uh, terminology in, uh, in the ancient world at the time was where uh, the, the location had been turned over not to the jurisdiction of the emperor but to the Roman Senate. Then that term would be proconsul. And the criticism leveled by the skeptics against the Bible was the Bible's wrong here. The guy, uh, Georgius Paulus, if he was really at Cyprus, should have been a propraetor, not a proconsul. So, which was it? <laughs> was Cyprus a senatorial province or an imperial province? Well, Luke says this was a proconsul. which would suggest that during Paul's day, Cyprus was a senatorial province, not an imperial province. Well, for many years, skeptics challenged that and said, nope, Luke made a mistake here. Well, old, uh, what's his name? The archaeologist we were just talking about. He dug around and he found that uh, by this period, the 
island had been transferred by the emperor to the senate. And this had occurred some, what, 30, 40 years before Luke refers to Sergius Paulus. So at the time Luke was writing, Cyprus was a senatorial province and therefore the proper term for the island magistrate was proconsul. He was right on the money, absolutely historically accurate. In 1912, Ramsey found a block of uh, stone at Antioch. See where Antioch is in relation to Cyprus? And it had the name Lucius Sergius Paulus engraved in the stone. And they've not been able to nail down whether it's the same fellow, but it shows the historicity and the accuracy of the time frame. A Quintus Sergius Paulus is mentioned in an inscription from Cathyra in the north of the island of Cyprus as holding an office um, apparently under Emperor Claudius. So, in other words, there's been enough confirmatory evidence to back Luke and to show that he was right on the money. What about uh, Acts 16? You might want to look at these in your translation. Uh, this text indicates that... Uh, there was a district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. English Standard Version um, has that. Uh, the New King James has, instead of district, part of Macedonia. Part of Macedonia. Uh, but the terminology here is actually very, uh, very specific. This is in Philippi. So, according to Luke, to use this term to refer to Philippi, uh, what was discovered was he was absolutely right. That is the proper designation for Philippi at this point in history. Uh, once again, Luke was right on the money. Drop down to verse 20 where Paul is taken, you remember, before these magistrates. What does your translation say there? Magistrates. These men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. Well, were there magistrates in Philippi? Uh, strategos, strategoi. So strategoi is the, the uh, Greek term, or praetors is the Roman term. Well, scholars question this title since the rulers of Philippi would normally be known as Dumvers. Dumvers. Archaeological inscriptions have confirmed. Praetor was a courtesy title for the supreme magistrates of a Roman colony. Philippi had become a Roman colony. See, all the, all the towns in the Roman Empire were not Roman. You had to be grant, granted that status. He's accurate about all of that too. Because Philippi was a Roman colony, its magistrates were given the title praetors. So you wouldn't necessarily catch this from the English because the translators have to give you the t a term so they give you magistrates because you wouldn't know what praetors is. Luke was meticulously accurate. We've got time for one more. In Acts chapter 17, where Paul goes to Thessalonica, twice in verses 6 and 8, he refers to the rulers of the city. They were the ones that uh, dragged uh, Jason and some of the brethren. Uh, there was a mob that dragged them to the rulers of the city. And... Uh, Well, the terminology that underlies that term is polytarch, polytarch. So Luke says that the rulers of the city of Thessalonica were polytarchs. That was thought to be incorrect. 
by scholars for a number of years until archaeology uncovered 19 separate inscriptions that use that very term with reference to Thessalonica. So see, the Bible was right. Everybody else was wrong. And the Bible knew it 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. Luke used the proper terminology. All right, I think our time is up, right? Any comments or questions? See, the Bible's loaded with this kind of thing. Um, didn't we look at the Hittites? I can't remember. We did mention them. Out in the news, you mean? Well, we'll have to look at that. If you see that, send it to me. But there were, what, some 25 references to the Hittites in Genesis alone. And for a long time, you know, these uh, liberal scholars 200 years ago criticized the Bible. No such people ever existed. And then they, uh, they uncovered the Hittite civilization. I wonder how many other civilizations we've not uh, found any proof of that are just there in the dusts of antiquity waiting to be uncovered. But the point that I'm making to you is that the Bible speaks with authority and it's geographically, historically accurate. It's been proven so over and over and over again. All right.
moves tonight. Huh? Number 341, our song of encouragement, 341. James Estabrook will lead us in a closing prayer in a few moments. Any of you ladies that are interested in participating in the secret Santa uh, needs to meet in the Andax right after our service. Tressa has been diagnosed with the virus, so we surely need to remember her. She has a number of health issues. And, uh, next Wednesday, I've forgotten about this till Conrad mentioned it to me just a moment ago, will be our, our devotional because that's the Wednesday right before Thanksgiving. So we'll have our devotional service and appreciate Conrad arranging all of that for us. And then this great news, uh, but she was baptized um, Sunday at uh, one of the congregations there in Tuscaloosa. And she's been coming here with us uh, for a while and we certainly are more than delighted to make that announcement and need to pray for this fine young woman who has manifested unusual interest in biblical things. I believe that's all that we have. In Jeremiah 1 and verse 13, God asked, that great prophet of old, what do you see? And Jeremiah answered, I see a seething or boiling pot. That one question and that one answer in a portion of that one verse is the background for the rest of that book, 52 chapters. And it's announced right there at the beginning, this giant boiling pot, seething pot that Jeremiah said he saw when God asked him, what do you see? And so all the way through that book, very lengthy book, you have this picture of this boiling pot. And it says that it faced toward the north. That boiling pot was the boiling pot, the seething pot of the wrath of God, the fury and the anger of God over a nation who had departed so far from God, loved their idols. Chapter 2, verse 25, they said there's no hope for us because we love these, we love these idols and we're going to stay with them. And so that boiling pot of wrath is pictured all the way through and you get to the last chapter. Pointing toward the north, toward Babylon. Babylon comes then against Jerusalem and destroys the city. That's a tragic portrait. In contrast to that, you've got the first chapter of the Bible that deals with the other portrait of the world. Genesis 1 and 2 is, is the world prior to sin, perfect world. But then you've got that tragic 
statement in verse 6 about the commencement of sin. Well, in verse 15 as well, we know, and then a few chapters later, chapter 12, verse 3, instead of a boiling, seething pot of the wrath of God, you've got this inconceivable, incomprehensible portrait of the love of God and the mercy and the grace and the long-serving, all of these warm, wonderful attributes of God. So right there at the very beginning of the history of mankind following the entrance of sin, you've got this wonderful portrait. And that stays with the Bible all the way through. And the last verse in the Bible points all the way back to that, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so pictured all the way through the Bible in contrast to Genesis 3, 6 is this beautiful portrait of the seed of woman, the seed of Abraham that pointed to man's only hope in Christ and the cross. What a contrast in those two pictures. And it's of course because of that second portrait of the coming of Christ, Calvary, and the church that Jesus said, I will build. The church grows out of Calvary and is the result of Calvary and the gospel that centers in Calvary. And that's where our hope lies. So if we obey the gospel, then we do not have to be faced with this boiling pot of divine wrath that's going to consume the masses of the earth. By faith, repenting of one's sins, confessing Christ, being baptized into Christ, because Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, allows one to participate in this great scheme of redemption that enables man to be saved from his sin. If you need to obey the gospel, you need the prayers of the church. We hope you'll come while we stand and sing. First two steps. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful building that you let us worship you in. We thank you for sending your Son to teach us the gospel and how to appropriate his sacrifice. We thank you for all that you've given to us. We pray, dear Father, that you may help us as we go out into the world. And in your son's most holy name we do pray. Amen.